All right, today I want to talk about what does the Bible say about smoking. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think I ever talked about this subject before. And uh, of course, most people think when I'm saying smoking, most people think of cigarette smoking, which we're going to talk about. Cigarettes, pipes, uh, any kind of tobacco type of a thing, cigars, whatever. We're going to talk about that. But uh, we're also going to look at some other types of smoking in the Bible see what the Bible actually says about the subject of smoking. Now, of course, you know, if you follow the ministry here, you know that one of the best things that you can do with your King James Bible when studying a subject is the law of first mention. What is the very first time that the Bible talks about a subject? So what's the very first reference to smoke? Genesis chapter 19. The very first book of your Bible Genesis chapter 19, verse 23. We're going to see the very first reference here to the word smoke. All right. Now, this shouldn't be very difficult, by the way, to understand what the word smoke is. This isn't some kind of archaic word or something like that. You know, this is a word that is very easily defined. But we're going to see what the Bible says about smoke and smoking. Genesis chapter... 19 verses 23 through 29 says the sun was risen upon the earth when lot entered into zoar then the lord rained upon sodom and upon gomorrah brimstone and fire from the lord out of heaven and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground but his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt and abraham got got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the lord and he said and he looked towards sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and behold, er, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. So what's the very first reference to smoke in your King James Bible? The very first reference is uh, speaking of when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Gomorrah? Well, because of the Sodomites. The modern day politically correct term would be homosexual or gay, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, you know, all that stuff. Uh, God destroys nations because of that sin, because of that perversion. You say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but uh, I'm struggling with those things, and I, I kind of feel that maybe I'm, you know, I have to question anybody that says that they're a Christian and has issues with that. Okay, That's a very, very serious, very wicked abomination. Um, does that mean that a uh, sodomite can't get saved? No, I didn't say that. I just simply said if a sodomite gets saved, then that lifestyle is gone. All right? I don't believe that a sodomite can be a saved sodomite and continue with that desire. Okay, That's very serious. God destroys nations because of the sin of sodomy. Um, God doesn't destroy nations because a couple people lied or because people were committing adultery or fornication or things. Those are wicked sins. But God hates the sin of Sodom. All right? It's a very, very grievous sin in his sight. That's why you see smoke coming up there. You know, it'd be like Abraham gets up and looks over that way and over there's the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and there's a great amount of smoke coming up and he realizes that God destroyed it because God told him he was going to destroy it. Now what about the word smoking? Where's the first reference to smoking in your King James Bible? Genesis chapter 15. Turn there. Genesis chapter 15. We're going to look at uh, verse 17 through 18. Okay, it says here, And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace, there's the first reference, and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And that, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Okay? Um, that's where I think I might have said 19. We're going to stop at 18 there. Because it gets into just, you know, the peoples there. But, the point is, God made a special covenant with Abraham and his descendants, 
And if you read back there in Galatians, the book of Galatians, it talks about that the uh, child of the bondwoman is not going to be heir with the child of the free woman. Okay? The descendants of Isaac, the Jews, are the ones that get this land. Okay? Not the descendants of Ishmael. Okay? Ishmael, Ishmael who was born to uh, Sarah's handmaid, Hagar, Agar, pronounced in, in there in Galatians, she, that, that son, Ishmael, became the father of the Arab people, okay, the Arabic people that have fought with the Jews now for thousands of years. Okay, they're not, they don't get the land. So you get these wacky Muslims out there and they say, we're descendants of Abraham. You know, we're descendants of Abraham. Well, they are, but it was according to sin. That's how they descended from Abraham. And they say, oh, the, the land is ours. No, it's, it belongs to the Jews. Okay? Not the uh, white patriots that stand for the Constitution. Not the uh, black people that say that, uh, that the real Jews are the ones that come from Africa. Okay? No, I mean the Jews, the descendants of Shem, the people that are there in Jerusalem right now. Okay? Those are the people. I want to be doing a sermon probably here I don't know when yet, but there's uh, this whole movement, this anti-Jewish movement, people trying to claim that they are the Jews and that because the Jews that are there in Israel are in unbelief, then they're not God's chosen people. Therefore, we're God's chosen people because we are in belief. That's nonsense. And it totally eliminates the, the whole purpose of the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, the time of Jacob's trouble is for Israel, you know, Jacob, and they are the real Jews, okay? Not a bunch of phony Gentiles trying to make themselves into Jews, okay? So watch out for that movement. But you see there again the thing of smoking. Now that smoking there was in direct relation. The first time we see smoke, it's in relation to God's judgment, okay? The second time there, it's in relation to God, the Spirit of the Lord passing through, you know, these these dead carcasses there basically and confirming a covenant with Abraham while Abraham is sleeping all right and God says this is an unconditional covenant you can't break this thing Abraham sins it's not like oh, oh sorry covenant's gone mm -mm. this is an unconditional covenant and those Jews are going to get that land in the millennial kingdom but it's interesting because God often appears in fire and smoke so you see the thing of smoke there, there are many times that has to deal with God, with God's wrath, with God's judgment. And here in Genesis 15, it's actually with the, God making a covenant with Abraham. But let's look at the next reference here, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus 3, beginning at verse 1. And of course, this is a very famous story here of fire and God, the two of those tying together. Let's look at this, Exodus 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Notice how your King James Bible defines itself there, the mountain of God. You go, I wonder what that would be, even to Horeb. So the mountain Horeb is the mountain of God. Very interesting. People say that the King James is hard to understand. No, not really. It defines itself quite often in the text. But uh, continuing here, verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Um, wait a second. I thought that there in verse 2 it said, The angel of the Lord. Here in verse 4, God called it unto him out of the midst of the bush. Verse 6, I am the God of thy father. Well, then that must be a contradiction. 
because you have an angel, the angel of the Lord, and you have God. See, that's a contradiction, right? No, because see, in the Old Testament, God often appeared as the angel of the Lord. And in fact, in the New Testament, you can read about there where Paul is on the, on the ship being taken, you know, to, to trial there in Rome. And he says about the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And he says, whose I am and whom I serve. So the angel of the Lord, oftentimes in your King James Bible, is a reference to God, a physical manifestation of God on the earth. Okay, there he's in a bush. And you see there again that this bush is burning. So again, you see this thing of burning and smoke, fire and smoke being associated with God. Very interesting. Uh, Exodus chapter 13. Go there next. Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. Okay, if you know the story of Exodus, you have Moses there. He gives told to go down to Egypt and to bring the children of Israel out. All right? So that's what's going on here in this passage. But look at this. Uh, Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them uh, the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Okay, so you see there that God is actually going before the children of Israel as a cloud during the day and as a pillar of fire by night. You know, also very interesting there. Because a cloud is very similar to smoke in a way. You could actually have smoke go up into the air and almost make it look like a cloud. Uh, that's going to be significant later. Remember that. Okay, Exodus chapter 19. See the next reference here. Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 through 18. Okay, it says here, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. So you see it there. God comes down actually physically where the, the children of Israel can see him. You know, it'd be kind of like that top of that hill over there. I wouldn't really call it a mountain, but top of that hill over there. And you see this big cloud descending down, and all of a sudden, just, and the thing just lights on fire, and there's all this smoke coming up and everything, and thunder and lightning with it. Uh, that might shake you up a little bit. I mean, you know, if, if that happened here behind me, I'd probably be going, whoa, you know, I think maybe I better take off running into the woods over here or something. I mean, that'd be pretty, pretty significant to see that. And of course, the children of Israel, they do quake and they're like, you go deal with, with God, Moses. You know, we don't want to deal with him this way anymore. We don't want to have him speak to us. You know, a lot of Christians are like that. They don't want to have God speak to them directly, face to face, you know, or I shouldn't say face to face, I should say um, through his word, you know, try to hide behind a preacher. Now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy 28. And of course there again in Exodus 19, you see the thing of fire and smoke and a cloud and smoke. Deuteronomy 28, verse 20. Yep, got to go one more page this way. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. Was that the right verse? Hmm, I think I wrote down the wrong verse. Yeah, I think I did. Huh. All right, well, I guess we'll go on to the next one. Sorry about that. I don't know why I wrote that one down. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 22. 
2 Samuel 22. See now, if I had a multi-million dollar studio and things, I could, you know, say cut and we could redo it, everything and all that other stuff. And I don't often do that, you know. Usually if I mess up, I just let it in there. I don't really do too many takes when I'm preaching because I want it to be real. So if you're looking for a Hollywood production, you came to the wrong place. Um, 2 Samuel 22. My notes blow around here. Verse 7 through 16. Okay, it says here, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled, the foundations of heaven moved and shook, because he was wroth. Then went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured, coals were kindled by it. Hmm, remember that verse. He bowed the heavens also, and came down, and darkness was under his feet. See what am I reading too? Okay. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind, and he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, and he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomforted them, and the channels of the seas or the sea appeared. The foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. Hmm, doesn't sound like a very good time when the Lord gets that angry that he, you know, judges the world that way. And it's kind of interesting that talks about the foundations of the earth, you know, moving and things. And Jesus Christ said that in the last days, you know, before the, he comes back, that there would be earthquakes in divers places. It's kind of like he's angry and he's, every time there's an earthquake, that's the Lord saying, you better repent. I'm getting ready to pour out judgment. Excuse me, judgment. You know. You better get saved. If you're watching this and, and you're still not saved and you're still messing around, you better get saved soon. Uh, God's judgment is going to come down on this earth and it's going to be the worst time ever. Really going to be something. Okay, but let's read verse 9 again there. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. Remember that. Okay? Turn to Job chapter 41. Job 41. Okay, verse 19. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. You say, well, then that must be God, because that's what we just read there back in 2 Samuel 22, verse 9. Right? Well, no, because who's it talking about? Verse 1 there, Job chapter 41, verse 1 says, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? You can't go fishing for a fire-breathing dragon. You wouldn't want to do that. Okay. But who is Leviathan? Well, turn, look at uh, verse 34. There in Job chapter 41, verse 34. He beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Do you think God is a king of the children of pride? No, it's not talking about the Lord. Who's it talking about? Well, turn to Psalm 74. Psalm 74. We're going to see who this Leviathan is. Psalm 74, verse 13 and 14 says here, Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragon in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. So you see there he's got multiple heads. Okay. Isaiah 26. 
Go to Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26, verse 20. Okay, it says here, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. Chapter 27, verse 1 says, In that day the Lord with his sore and great so strong Great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Okay, now notice a couple of things here. First of all, the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble are going to need to hide themselves until the indignation be overpassed. So what's the context here? It's talking about the Jews in that time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to have to hide themselves from the wrath of God, as well as the wrath of the Antichrist basically. He'll be hunting them down. Okay? Secondly there, the Lord is going to punish this lost world like never before in history during that time period there. Okay? You know, verse 21 there, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Absolutely. But notice there in chapter 27 verse 1, it says about the Lord punishing Leviathan and that he, Leviathan is described as a dragon in the sea very interesting. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. Turn way back to the back of your Bible. Revelation 12, 3. You say, but I thought the devil was this little red man, you know, that has the feet, lower body of a goat, and, and then he's got little horns and a little tail and pitchfork and stuff like that. I thought that was the devil. No, that's Hollywood. Okay, it's, it's similar to a cherub, which the devil was the anointed cherub at one point there before he fell. But, you know, it's not what the devil looks like. Okay, Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. It says here, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now, if you remember back there in Psalm 74... Leviathan was described as having multiple heads, you know. So, what's the tie-in here? Turn to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Okay, and if you look at verse 7 there, it says about the dragon fought and his angels. So, who is Leviathan a reference to? Well, in type, it is a reference to Satan. Okay, now I do believe that there were dragons, as the King James Bible calls them. We would call them dinosaurs today. I do believe that there were dragons in the past. So I think that the Lord was certainly showing Job. You know, he talks about Behemoth. He talks about Leviathan. I think he was showing him the creatures that were alive. And there's some really interesting studies out there. I still think the best material is Ken Hoven on the issue of uh, dinosaurs in the Bible, dinosaurs being around with men there in the past. And many people say that Job is the oldest book in the Bible, so Job would have been around to see a lot of that, you know, those, you know, animals. I don't want to call them prehistoric because that implies that it's before history was recorded, and I think that's evolution nonsense, okay? Um, the Bible talks about dragons. It's not fantasy. It's not symbolic. I believe it's literal. And, you know, in this passage here, the dragon, the ultimate dragon, is Satan. Leviathan. Okay? That's what's being talked about there. Alright? And it's kind of interesting. And we'll get into this um, more as we continue here. Actually, turn to Psalm 18. If you haven't ever heard my sermon on Satan, you ought to listen to that sometime because I get into one of the most interesting things in the Bible, and that is that Satan is a master counterfeiter. Um, there are so many things that the Lord is and does that Satan counterfeits and Satan copies. And uh, we'll continue here. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Psalm 18, verse 6. Okay, Psalm 18, verse 6 through 8. 
In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken, because he was wroth. Then went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. Okay. Now, if you remember, in 2 Samuel, we read the same thing. David's writing there. David's writing here in Psalm. And he says about God, actually when God gets angry, smoke comes out of his nostrils and fire comes out of his mouth. You know, kind of interesting because back there in... Revelation 19, you have Jesus Christ coming back down to fight the Antichrist and his army, and a sword comes out of his mouth and slays 200 million man army of the Antichrist, the Battle of Armageddon. And then we go riding down through all that mess and stuff. But the point is, God, when he judges, all he has to do is speak. Okay? His word comes out like a sword. And the Bible also describes the word of God as like fire. Okay? So, very, very interesting things there. But notice how Satan, in type as Leviathan, actually also has the same thing. He has smoke coming out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth. Hmm. Now, a lot of preachers, a lot of the brethren will try to say, you know, see, they'll read the passage there about Leviathan, and they say, so, you know, you have somebody that's smoking, trying to imitate their father, the devil, you know, where you have the coals of fire kindled, in your mouth, you know, sparks leaping out, you know, like that, and smoke out of the nostrils, you know, like they do. And they'll say, so why would you want to smoke? You'll be like your father, the devil. You'll be like Leviathan. Um, well, that argument is true to some extent, but you see, it doesn't work totally because God also does the same thing. But let me ask you a question. You say, oh, praise the Lord, and I can smoke, right? Then I'll be like God, you know. I'll be Christ-like because I can have smoke coming out of my nostrils and kindle fire in my mouth. I can be like the Lord then. Um, no, because you see, when the Lord does it, it's out of wrath. It's out of anger. You don't smoke cigarettes or cigars or pipes out of wrath and anger. You smoke it to enjoy yourself or to calm your nerves or some other thing like that. Okay? So don't try to use that scripture. Don't try to use what I've preached to you today to justify your sin of smoking cigarettes. And it is a sin, by the way. We're going to talk about that later on. But that doesn't work. And why does Satan imitate God in that? Well, because that's Satan's standard operating procedure. You know, that's what he does. Satan, anything that God does, Satan will imitate it. He'll copy it. He'll pervert it. He'll twist it. See? He wants people to worship Him instead of the Lord. And the best way to do that is to try and get as close to God as you can. You know, which doesn't work, really, you know, but uh, as far as between God and the devil, you know, but uh, unfortunately it does work for most people. Most people are worshiping Satan, thinking that they're worshiping God. The Christ of the average modern-day Christian is actually the Antichrist. Um, you study it out, they're worshiping the Antichrist already. They're not worshiping Jesus from the King James Bible. All right? they're, they're not worshiping the man that appears in this book, in other words. You know, they're worshiping a Christ of their own imagination, and that imagination is evil. And you look at the guy that they're talking about, it's the Antichrist. All right? But let's continue on here. Um... Let's look at some more examples of smoke being connected with God's judgment. Psalm 68. Turn to Psalm 68. We're going to hit a bunch of scriptures now. Just looking at what the Bible has to say about smoke. Psalm 68, verses 1 and 2. says, Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Now again, in type, that's a picture of somebody in hell. You say, well, good, then they perish, then they're gone. Annihilation, you know. No, because you can perish eternally. You can die eternally. If you have been given an immortal body that never truly goes away, well, you're continually perishing. You're continually, just like we have eternal life, they have eternal death. 
they have eternal perishing. So you see that there. You know, this is a given as a type of somebody in hell. Revelation chapter 14, verse 11. We're going to see another tie in here. Revelation 14, 11 says here, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Okay, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up until they're burned up. It doesn't say that. It ascends up forever and ever. You say, well, that's just, you know, talking about people burning in hell and then they're gone. Um, well, wouldn't, you know, hell run out of people eventually? Yeah, you know. How can their fire, the smoke of their torment, how can that go up for, you know, forever and ever if people burn up? And notice it does not say the smoke of their bodies, you know, being burned in the crematorium or something. It's the smoke of their torment. These people that say that hell's not eternal, they're going to hell and they're just trying to air condition it before they move in. Okay? And notice it says there too, they have no rest day nor night. Well, how does that work? You know, if hell is just annihilation, you get burned up real quick. How would you have no rest day or nor night? It wouldn't work. Okay. Don't believe these false prophets, these wicked devil possessed false prophets that are trying to come out and tell you that hell is just annihilation or hell is the grave or whatever, because a loving God would never send anybody to hell. Um, that's very true. Actually, a loving God would never send anybody to hell because a loving God provided a way out of hell. And if you go to hell, it's because you rejected God's way out. Okay? You rejected Jesus Christ. That's why you went to hell, so it's your own fault. Psalm 74, verse 1. Back to the Old Testament. Psalm 74, verse 1. Okay, Psalm 74, 1 says, O God, why hast thou cast us off forever? Why doth thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pasture? Again, and very sadly, this scripture here, I would say, kind of pictures a Jew that died without Jesus Christ. A Jew is a sheep of God's pasture. They are God's chosen people, but if they reject Jesus Christ, they go to hell. And this, their smoke rises up. How very tragic. You know, if you're Jewish, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Messiah. He was the only one who ever filled Isaiah chapter 53. And, you know, if you reject that, you're probably going to accept the Antichrist when he shows up. And if you take the mark, you're going to be damned. You know, very, very tragic, very sad. Psalm 104. Psalm 104, verse 31 and 32. says here, The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. He looketh on the earth, and it trembleth. He toucheth the hills, and they smoke. Kind of like what he did back there with Moses and the children of Israel. When he came down and he touched the hill, it smoked, and it burned. Yeah. The Lord can show his power in very miraculous, marvelous ways. Psalm 144. Turn my back to the wind here so my pages don't get blown all over the place. Psalm 144, verses 5 and 6 says, Bow thy heavens, O Lord, and come down, touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Cast forth lightning and scatter them, shoot out thine arrows and destroy them. Again, you see smoke and fire being connected to God's judgment. Okay? And uh, there will be plenty of that in the future. Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. It says here, And in that day shall, or in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. 
In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. It's talking about the time, the end of the time of Jacob's trouble going into the millennium. Verse 3, And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning, and the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day, notice that, cloud and smoke by day, and the shining of a flaming fire by night, for upon all the glory shall be a defense. And there shall be a taber tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a covert from storm and from rain. So there you have a very interesting picture of the millennial kingdom. Just like back there in Exodus, where the Lord is leading the children of Israel away from Egypt, and he's leading them by a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire by night, he brings that thing back in the millennial kingdom. Very interesting. And notice it doesn't just say there, a cloud. It actually says a cloud and smoke by day in verse 5. So it's a cloud and smoke. So the Lord there has that as a sign to the Jewish people. Smoke and fire. All right. Very interesting. Um, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. It says here, in that year, uh, or excuse me, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And it stood, above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Does this happen again? Turn to Revelation chapter 15. Revelation 15. And these aren't all the references to smoke in the King James Bible, by the way. I just picked, you know, the ones that related to the subject mostly. There's, of course, smoke that they, you know, the smoke of the incense and things that the priests burn, the smoke of the burnt offerings and things like that. But it doesn't quite relate to the study, so a lot of those I didn't cover. You know, some people have this mistaken notion that I have to cover every single reference to what I'm talking about uh, for the sermon to be legitimate, and I don't. You know, if the Lord shows you scriptures that I don't bring up, well, praise the Lord. You know, um, your job is to be uh, in touch with the Holy Spirit of God, um, not in touch with Brian Denlinger. You know, I do my best to put together sermons and messages, but my only job is to point you to Jesus Christ, okay, through His Word. That's my job. That's what I do. Uh, Revelation chapter 15, verse 5. Okay, it says here, and after that I looked, and behold, the tabernacle, of the, or the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open, and the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Interesting, the one passage there in the Bible says about our God is a consuming fire. And I've heard it said that, you know, a lot of times, you know, these, I shouldn't say a lot of times, but I've heard it said that it could be that the people who get into God's presence in eternity, our God's a consuming fire, they, don't, they haven't been redeemed, and so they burn. And that's what hell is. You know, it's very interesting. But you see this thing over and over and over again where God is angry and he is actually burning and he's mad and there's smoke involved. Uh, very interesting. One minute, please.